house of God this morning, able to worship with all of you in person and online. Um, why don't we lift our hands? I'm going to pray really quick and we're going to hop straight into worship. Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, that we can gather and worship you, Father, this morning. But Lord, we can do that throughout the week, God. And we thank you that we have that privilege, Father, that your spirit is with us and moving amongst us, God. I pray we never take that for, for granted. I pray we soak in every moment this morning, Lord, of your presence, of your word. Father, as we worship you, God, I pray we worship you with our heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit, Lord. May our gaze and our eyes be fixed towards you this morning, Lord. We love you. Amen. so great.
just want to be where you are And I just want to be near your heart There is nothing like your love There is nothing like your love
There's no one like you. Mountains tremble when you speak. I'm listening. Your whisper changes everything. Almighty God. There's no one like you. Almighty God. There's no one like. There's no one like you. 
Isaiah, Isaiah came through a time where it seemed like everything was just going wrong. It says that in the year that Uzziah died, the king, the king died. And, you know, when the rulers died at that time, the whole land was in upheaval. There's political unrest. People didn't know where the uh, food would come from. They didn't know what armies would attack them. All the treaties that were signed by the king previously, they were null and void. So you didn't know what enemy was coming. You know, sometimes in life, we can run, seems a ground that things are just so difficult, so hard, and not because of anything we've done. It's just life is unfolding in such a way, it's difficult, it's hard, it's laborious, and sometimes there's fear in it. But it said in the year that Uzziah died, it says, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Isaiah chapter six. And he says, I saw the Lord and my eyes came off of my difficulties, my situations and how bad it was. And I put it on the Lord and I saw him lifted up. He says, I saw the train of his glory fill the temple. All I, was, all I saw was God's glory. I didn't see the difficulties. I didn't see the problems. I didn't deny them. I didn't say they weren't there. I just put my eyes on the Lord. And when that happened, it says, you also heard the Lord's voice. And I believe God wants to speak to every one of us. I love to pick this song back up here, worship team. I love for us to be able to say, okay, let's take our eyes off of whatever's going on in your life right now, how difficult it is. Maybe it's financially, relationally. Maybe there's just a tug of war going on in some difficult area of your life. In the year that whatever happened right now today, can you see the Lord high and lifted up? Can you begin to be captivated by his glory and his presence? You maybe say, well, what is that? What, what does it mean to be captivated by God's glory? It means you take your eyes off of what you see in the earthly realm. 
and you begin to call and say, God, show me your presence. Let me be captivated by who you are right now in the difficulty that I'm going through. Because when we see his presence, we also hear his voice. God wants to speak to us. Let's lift this song back up to the Lord. Let's call out unto him. You know, he heard the angels as seraphim saying, holy, 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 three times holy, because he's not holy enough to say it once. Let's begin to worship him. Let's just take a couple minutes. Let's take our eyes off ourselves and our situations, and let's begin to lift the Lord. Lift your hands up if you want. All it is is an act of surrender. It's in the physical saying, Lord, I give up. I surrender to you. Let's sing this to the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Come on, you are the Lord. You are the Lord. Let the nations, oh, let the nations sing. You are the Lord. Jesus, King of kings, you are. Lord, we just pray for every heart and every life, whether they're here today or they're online. God, we pray, Lord, that you would come and reveal your glory. Let us see the train of your glory fill the temple, fill our homes, fill our marriages, fill our difficult situations. God, we want to put our eyes on you right now. God, maybe there's those that are just now starting to walk with you and trying to experience you and understand who you are. This seems so, so big, but all it is is, God, we want to put our eyes not on our natural life, but we realize, God, you're above everything, so we put our eyes on you. You, oh God, who rule and reign over everything, we trust you. We, we yield our lives. We separate our lives to you right now and say, God, be king over everything. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. God, we want to hear your voice in our lives. Call us to you, Lord. Invite us to you as we yield our hearts and our lives to you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Well, you know what we can do these days is we can go say hi to people. We can turn around and look at some people and say, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time without a mask. So why don't we just take two minutes here, quickly turn around. For those that feel comfortable, if you don't feel comfortable, don't move. We will leave you be. But if you feel comfortable, go say hi to a few people. We're the body of Christ, the family. It's good to have family home. Introduce yourself. They don't know what you look like without a mask.
we will have time to talk to people afterwards, get connected once again. I love seeing the house of God, the family, everybody connecting one with another. It's like a family reunion again. We even got some of those weird uncles that we're not too sure if we want to see them again. No, just kidding. Yeah, family is family. Be seated. Great to have you here. I'm going to give you a couple of announcements as we make our way. Again, we want to put it out there that uh, anybody is welcome, whether you have a mask on or not. If you feel still feel uh, uncomfortable coming into a public setting with a, without a mask on, please come. Don't let that hold you back. We want to have you part of the house of God, the family. Uh, be encouraged. Uh, the house is open for you. We've got room for you. So just make note of that. Well, as we make our way through summer, I know there's going to be holidays and people going places and doing things. I want to just remind you, it's still opportunity that you can give online with our online giving through our website at uh, the pearlchurch.ca. There's uh, giving there. You can also do it through Planning Center or the Church Center app. If you have not picked up this Church Center app, uh, put it on your phone, put it on one of your devices. Uh, you can find out information about the church. You can get connected with us with a newsletter, but you can also do your giving that way. Uh, so that's available. Uh, so it's very handy that way. Uh, you can also do your giving on, uh, have it as a set time that you just do regular giving. So it's all looked after for you, or you can do it uh, as uh, God would just put it on your heart. Uh, you can also send it in. You can do it by e-transfer or you can uh, give it uh, by mail. So make note of that. Uh, through the summer, uh, if you're not with us, we still want to pray for you. We want to know what's going on so we can connect with you. And if you're new in the house, I want to say that we do have a registration card that we can just have a record of your visit with us. Uh, leave us your email. We'll give you the uh, newsletter that takes place that shows you all the activities, the uh, directions or addresses and the times and how you become part of that. So we look forward to that. But do fill out the visitor card so uh, we can connect with you. I um, also want to say that we do have our church family picnic coming up July uh, 25th after a Sunday service, and we're going to make our way down to uh, Victoria. Uh, the site information is on the newsletter, uh, direction, how to get there, all those kind of things. We look forward as a family getting together beyond these walls and go out and have some fun, play some bocce ball, find out who the reigning champ still is on bocce ball, and uh, just letting you know in case you wanted to know, and play some good activities, but just hang out with one another, bring some food. Um, it's just building family. And if you're new in the house, please, that, those are great times for you to come out and be a part of some great things. Uh, this Friday, we also have Exquisite Company taking place. And that's with Don and Lee Scott, who are just uh, to, in the front here. They're going to raise their hand there just in case you want to know. Uh, but that is for those that are 45 and over-ish, 40-ish and over, somewhere in there. I don't know what they are. Um, older than me. No, just kidding. Yeah. Uh, 50, 50 and over. Uh, uh, anyway, there, there's like, I don't know, 20, 20 couples or something like that that are going to be hanging out and just uh, uh, busting up the house, just like the old days when the youth used to come over. Um, and uh, But this Friday night, I, think I don't know if the information is there, 7 o'clock, please see Don and Lee's. Uh, they'd love to have you if you're not already knowing about it. Uh, there's going to be a lot of room just to connect and uh, building the house of God. So please make aware of that on Friday evening. That's it for my announcements. Well, you know what? It's been great having um, Aniston uh, Elias with us, who is our children's uh, coordinator now. And if there's children in the house, I think they're all gone. I saw them get up and leave. Uh, but just to let you know, as parents, they are actually now no longer downstairs in the auditorium, but they are in a classroom right beside us here. Uh, it's a beautiful classroom that we have for the kids, so we're excited about uh, the kids' ministry there. Thank you, musicians. Well, let's open up uh, God's Word. Uh, I was thinking about the Word and what the Word of God is in our lives. You know, I don't know if you go fishing. I'm not a big fisherman, but I have been fishing. Uh, I have cast uh, my, not only my hook, but there are times when I was younger, I cast the whole rod into the lake because like, I was just so like, and it just, the whole thing went. My dad had to go jump in the water and go get it. But I was just thinking about catching fish, and you know, uh, the hook uh, it's got to get into the mouth of the of the fish, and uh, uh, somewhere along the line, it's got to get pulled, right? It's got to get pulled and set inside the gills in the mouth so that when you're reeling it in, uh, it fully comes in. Well, you know, it's like the Word of God. The Word of God has got a hook into us that we don't just surface read it, surface hear it, but it hooks into us. Why? Because the Lord wants to catch our heart. 
The Lord wants to catch our soul and our heart and pull it in closer to him. So I encourage you as you come in on Sundays and uh, whether you have a device that you're following the word of God on, uh, your iPhone, on new version, or you've got the uh, uh, more the godly authorized version uh, that's in paper, uh, somehow you're, you're following along with us. Um, and, you know, even taking notes, I encourage you, especially the young people in the house of God, if you want to really grow, I believe there comes something when you study the word, when you take the word in and you make note of it so that you can hide it in your heart, all right? So you don't just hear it, but I encourage you with that. Well, I'm loving, my, my wife and I have been talking about this, Lori and I, that uh, every Sunday we just can't wait to see more and more of the church return, more of the family come back, get to see you. Uh, calling uh, uh, more and more people just back into the house and seeing the families come. And I believe COVID isolated us for a season. It sort of set some boundaries around us. But I believe what it did is it put a hunger in us. We realize now more than ever, we need people. We need one another. We need to be with, we were made for each other, believe it or not. And as much as you might say, I'm not too sure about that person next to me. Don't look at your spouse. But we are made for each other. We're made to be together in community. The first problem in creation was not sin. It was that man was alone. And he said it wasn't good. God called us to be together. We are called to be in relationship. Building, community, worshiping side by side. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. I just want to talk about this for a minute before we get into the actual sermon here. But we're talking about these encounters with Jesus. And Matthew 11, 28, 29, I believe more than ever, is God's heart to you and I, especially coming out of this 15 months or so of COVID situation. And God is calling us directly to come and have an encounter with him, to come into a relationship in community with him. It's the heart of the Lord. And I believe our lives can only become what God wants us to become when we have this encounter with him, when we do it in community. Matthew 11, 28, 29 in the NIV says this, come to me. Now, I, I know we say come to church, but it's not about the church. It's about the relationship we have with Jesus Christ that happens at the church. But all of us, he's calling all of us to come to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and will, you will find rest for your souls. Rest, rest, rest. And I, I believe even after coming out of all this isolation, separation, our souls are still crying out for rest. We need rest. We need something that will settle us down. The Message Bible, Eugene Peterson writes it this way. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Religion, man's system. Man's system to find life and purpose and to get right with God. Come to me, he says. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The invitation, come to me. He says, come as you are. He puts no restraints, no caveat on us. He doesn't say, come to me if. He just simply says, come to me. Have an encounter. And the call of God for every one of us is on a daily basis is come to me. He invites us into where we not only find rest, but we end up finding life. Jesus said, I've come to bring life, life more abundant, more full, with meaning, with purpose. There's a lot of people that have resources, but they don't have much meaning. And the Lord says, you know, I want you to have meaning. I want you to have a reason for being, and the Lord will give that to us. And when you encounter him, we find that life that we're meant to live. And I believe you'll also learn to live freely and lightly. This world is constantly, and we are constantly putting burdens on us that we were never meant to carry. Never meant to carry so much of this alone. And the Lord says, no, come to me, yoke with me, learn the unforced rhythms of grace, which is that unmerited favor of God. You don't, you don't deserve God's grace, but God gives it to you. You don't deserve God's favor, but God will give it to you. But we have to come to him, have to have this encounter with him. You have to encounter it. And here's the thing. We don't have an encounter once where I can say back November 13th, 1982, I know when I came to the Lord and encountered him, and that's when my day of born again was. No, I have to have regular encounters with Jesus. I update my system, as it were, my operating system. I have to update it constantly. So I go to Jesus in prayer and seeking God. I come to the house of God. What am I doing? I am updating my experience with the Lord. So we can have once an experience, but we have a regular experience, and in the future, we keep coming to the Lord. Now, I know that 
we can meet with the Lord anywhere. I know I've been, I've been at times where I'm just worshiping God. I got my windows rolled up, and I know my neighbors driving beside me are thankful for that because I am singing at the top of my lungs, and it might not be the best for anybody else to hear but me and Jesus. But that's okay. I'm meeting Jesus. There's something about worship. There's something about prayer time. There, it can happen anywhere. It can happen wherever you happen to be today. But God, not man, God ordained the local church the gathering of believers together. He ordained a community of faith where God says, I will come and meet with you. I will put my name on it. I'll put my eyes on it. I'll put my life on it, he says, and his presence comes. And there's something about corporate gathering. And I just want to encourage you that are here, but you that are online, that God called us out of sin and darkness, not to sit in darkness alone, to sit by in isolation, he called us out to bring us into community, to build up one another, encourage one another, your gifts, your talents, your ability to bless my life, and then, believe it or not, our ability to bless your life. We called into community. And today we're going to look at community out of Mark chapter 2. And I believe one of the encounters that we have, and this is found in community, but it's also you and I individually having this encounter with Jesus in Mark chapter 2, there's a number of encounters that takes place. Not just one person, there's a, a multitude, a community, a, a group. And I believe what we have to understand is that each one of us is called to have this kind of encounter. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes we can read the Word of God and we go, oh, well, the encounter was just this person and this person. When you have to understand the context, who else was there, what was being said, and to who was being said. And oftentimes, you know, you and I read the Word of God and we go, oh, David and Goliath. <laughs> I'm David. No, sometimes you're Goliath. And we, sometimes you're the Philistines. And sometimes you're the brothers who, who are just envious. And sometimes you're King Saul. You're just oblivious. Sometimes we're all the people in the story. So I think it's important that when we read the Word of God, we are looking to see what God has to say as it applies to us at all times, all right? Mark chapter 2. We need to ask, which one am I? And how's this going to work? Verse 1, it says this. And again, he, Jesus, entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Come on. It was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word of God. When I read this passage, my heart just leaps. I go, come on, this, God, this is what I'm looking for. I'm longing to see, see a house packed. I'm longing to see people just come together. I'm longing to see people noise about, just make it known that Jesus is in the house. There's such a, a dynamic in the house, not to say there isn't, but it just continues to build. There's excitement. There's celebration. There's worship. There's people talking and chattering and calling out their neighbors and saying, you wouldn't believe what happened at church today. You won't believe what we're going to do next Sunday. You ought to come. And there's just this groundswell of everybody coming in, and they're telling everybody that Jesus is in the house. And the people got excited when they came to church. It's like the neighborhood heard about it. You know, it's amazing. We've got people that will have the odd party in our neighborhood, and uh, it gets a little loud. And uh, sometimes we've got to close the windows, and sometimes there's just a lot of noise going on. And it's like you, you, you want to peer in and see what kind of party is this, what's going on, what's happening there. And uh, that's the way the church should be. The church should be in the neighborhood having the loudest part of the people say, well, what's going on? Not because of the volume, but because of the energy and excitement that's going on. People are peering over the fence saying, hey, what's going on over at the church? What's happening there today? I see kids ministry. I see, see cars parked. I see people happy afterwards after church. I see a lot of people uh, just meeting one, one another. And uh, I, I'm just uh, excited for the whole, all the churches of Edmonton that there would be a clear, visible presence of God in every church where every believer goes. I, I don't just believe it for my church. I believe it for every church, every denomination, where there are believers gathering, that there should be the presence of God being manifest, so much so that lives are changed, that homes and marriages are touched, that everybody is encouraged. And uh, um, I, I believe, you know, we celebrate our, our stars, we celebrate our sports, we celebrate our uh, politicians. We celebrate so many people, and we're willing to post about it. We're willing to Twitter about it. We're willing to uh, put it on Facebook. But you know, there is one other that is perhaps more worthy than anyone else to receive any accolades and any posting and any Twittering, and that is Jesus. 
that we're willing to say, Jesus, who's the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the Son of Man, the Son of God, he is the not just the Alpha and Omega, but he's the resurrection and the life, that he's worthy of a little bit more attention than some of these other people that are made $6 million a year because they're chasing a little black puck on the ice. And we're willing to say something about it. And I believe that that's the call of you and I, is that what would happen if all of a sudden we noised it about in such a manner that Jesus was in the house? Then all of a sudden the churches began to be so packed and so full that there was no room to get in. You know, it says so many gathered that there was no room to receive anyone else. The room was packed. And, and uh, I long for the, obviously the room to be packed, but I want to say there's always room for one more. We'll always make room. We'll always find a chair. We'll always somehow make room. If that, if that is packed up, we'll put people out here. And if, if this is packed up, we'll open up the doors and we will have it so that nobody can be on the outside. We'll go to two service, whatever it is. But Jesus preached the word to them. And I thought this was interesting. I thought this is by no mistake that this would be noted. He preached the word. They came not because of the lights, not because of the entertainment, not because of all the dynamic things that are visual. They came because they wanted to hear the word. And I believe God is building churches that are hearing the word, that want to come to hear that. And I know that's you. You want to come to see, hear the word. And I know the reason I know that you're not here for the entertainment value, because there's little entertainment value. <laughs> we don't have much going on with lights, and we don't have much going on with smoke. We don't have much going on with the big bands and all those things. We're, we're here just to know Jesus and have his word preached to us and go into his word and say, God, what is it that you have for us? But people came to hear the word of God. Mark chapter two, verse three says this, then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near because of, of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed where the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, you son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his hearts that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? I love that. Jesus knows what you're thinking. Just letting you know, he knows what you're thinking in your heart. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your son, sins are forgiven, or say to you, arise, take up your bed and walk. I mean, taking up your bed and walk, it's... Man, you, you'll see it taking place. Sin's forgiven, you're not too sure what happens. So he does them both. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose, took his bed, went into the presence of them all, so that they are all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this before. I love that. I never saw anything like this before. You know, when Jesus shows up, it's something that you've never seen before. It's something you'd never usually expect, but God wants to do these kind of miracles in our lives. And in this account, we have a number of people that have an encounter with Jesus. And quickly, we go to maybe one or maybe two. We'll see them. We go, oh, yeah, I, I get the story. Well, well, there's more to it than just that. And I, I think I want you to understand this. Jesus wants you to be more than who you think you are. And I think sometimes we settle we settle for who we think we are, and we're not willing to hear maybe God call us up a little higher, call us up a little more, that we go from faith to faith. Don't settle for who you are, become who Jesus wants you to become. And that's the challenge with any encounter. Jesus will encounter you never to leave you the way you are. He wants you to become somebody else. You know, first we got these four guys. These four guys come along and they see a paralyzed man, might be a friend, might be a family member, who knows, but these four guys come along and they, they pick up the corners of this mat and they pick it up and they carry him to the house and they, they want to bring him in to see Jesus. And, and it says that the, the house was packed. There's no way to get in through the usual doorway, the front door. So what do they do? They, they, they do what's obvious and then they begin to carry him up the side of the house they begin to climb up the side of the house where there were steps. And I don't know if you can imagine coming up narrow steps with four people carrying one mat with one paralytic on it. And they are carrying him in such a way that they don't drop him. There would be nothing worse than say, hey, we got this. We'll start carrying him up. And all of a sudden they've got to run back down the stairs and pick him back up again, put him on the mat and start carrying him back up. They did it in such a way that no matter how awkward it was, how difficult it was, their priority was getting that man before Jesus. They begin to carry him to the top of the house and they begin to, begin to dig into the roof. 
and they start making a hole. And the hole was not made just big enough to hear Jesus. Now let's just, just, just sort of just dig a little hole so we can just hear his voice. We'll just hear him. No, and it wasn't just big enough that they could see Jesus. You know, let's just carve out a little, uh, we'll just make this sort of like a little sunroof. Kind of, we'll just open it up, or like in the kitchen, like we all have just those sunroofs maybe coming down. No, they said, you know what? We're not going to make it just so that we can hear him, so we can see him. We're going to make it big enough that we can actually lower him down in front of Jesus. See, when, when we're bringing somebody to Jesus, let's, let's get it right now, understand If you're going to bring somebody to Jesus, it's going to get messy. You're going to have to get involved. You're going to have to get vulnerable. You're going to have to start maybe giving your life. Your hands are going to get messy. Your knees are going to get messy. There's going to be a mess all around, but but that's okay. It says in verse 5, when when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your son, your sins are forgiven you. Then in verse 10 and 11, he says, said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. He healed them. We got this church going on, and many scholars will tell you that it's Peter's house. Previously, Peter's entertaining them, and his mother-in-law gets healed. This is Peter's house, most likely. Jesus is preaching. Peter's not doing the preaching. Let Jesus preach. That's a good thing to do when Jesus is in the house. Let him preach. We begin to see what's taking place here. Peter's willing to let his house be used for the church. And I don't know about you, but knowing Peter and his history, I probably wouldn't choose Peter to be the first host of the local church. I mean, Peter's got a bad rap. We know what goes on. Later he gets transformed, but I wouldn't have chosen Peter. But how many know and thank God that God does not choose people the way we choose people? You know, a lot of times we choose based on what we see on the outside, but we know out of 1 Samuel, God chooses people based on the heart. God chooses us not because of who we are, but really in spite of who we are. He chooses the foolish and the weak to confound the wise and the strong. God uses us, the weak ones, the broken ones. God uses us so that we can carry his glory and out of the brokenness of our lives, it begins to leak out and God's glory begins to touch lives. All of a sudden, the pathway is marked by, by the leaking out of God's presence in our lives to so many other people. God will use us, not because of us, but in spite of us. And they ran out of room. They ran out of room. There was too many people i got to tell you, I long for a packed church, but I don't long for a packed church that won't make room for broken people. And I believe we always have to have a mindset that it's not about us, it's about those that are broken, lost, those that are needing to be rescued, those that are needing to be healed. We will build the church, but the church isn't for us. The church is for those that are on the outside that need to be rescued, that are lost and need to be brought in. We don't become a social club. We don't become a, a fish aquarium we become fishers of men and bring them in. But here's this challenge, and one of the challenges I want to be for, I want you to notice. Can, can we be uh, those that are willing, it says, to have our faith seen? Jesus saw their faith. He saw their faith bringing somebody else to church, getting messy, giving of their lives to help somebody else out. And I believe that God wants us to be, have this challenge. I want you to notice what happens. They each picked up one of the corners of the mat. They walked in unity. There's something going on. There's something that tied them together. And one of the main things that ties people together to show your faith is a thing called compassion. They had compassion for the broken, for the lost. They had compassion for this man that was on a mat, that he couldn't get up, that he couldn't move himself, that he could not get to the place of healing. They responded first in compassion. I believe more than ever, yes, we need to have a passion for church, but we need to have a compassion for those that are outside the church walls, that we go to them. You know, the four men didn't say, hey, you get over here and we'll get you to Jesus. They went out and got him. They had compassion. They went out and got him. They went and picked up one of the corners of each of the mat, of the mat and they began to bring him. And I believe we need to be those whose our hearts break for what breaks God's heart. That we're willing to get out of our lethargy and our, 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 our convenience and our, our comfortability and say, what is over there? How do I reach them? How do I go to them and bring them to where Jesus is? And it starts with compassion, not sympathy. 
Because sympathy doesn't demand action. Compassion demands action. You respond to them. And I think we, when, we don't have, when, when we have this compassion, we realize it's not us to judge. That we don't judge them because they're on the mat. We don't judge them because of their limitations. We don't judge them because they're not like us. We don't judge them, listen to me, we don't judge them because their sin is not the same as our sin. Because we realize we're all broken people. We're all sinners. But that compassion led them to get together and go to that man. And what did they do? They, they carried the man uh, to the church and they couldn't find it. Here's the second thing that they did. Uh, they became creative. They said, hey, you know what? That doorway's not going to work. What's another way to get him to Jesus? And too often, the old ways of coming to church isn't working anymore. And it's not for churches to come up with some marketing scheme and man-made plan and let's go to the best conference to find out what works. We got to hear from God and let God speak into our hearts and then begin to way, do God's ways of how to bring people. But I love the fact that they were creative. They said, hey, there's stairs on the side. And they go, so let's carry them up. Can you imagine all of a sudden the, the light going on? They got creative. Let's carry them up. And I believe sometimes we become so stuck in our ways about bringing people to the house of God, the church, or bringing them to the Lord, or talking about Jesus. It's like if it doesn't follow this formula, it doesn't work. Not going to do it. And we give up and we quit. And all of a sudden we give up so easy in trying to bring people to a place of healing and wholeness and try to draw them in. And I believe we need to be creative. And how do we become creative? I believe we get relational. I believe one of the things we've stopped doing is becoming relational with people that don't go to church. We need to be relational. Invite them. Build a relationship. Have them over. Have a barbecue. Take them out for dinner. Take them food. It's amazing what food will do to, to break any of the tensions that are there. But you find a way to be creative. And all of a sudden, you, they built a relationship, and they were able to bring this man to, to Jesus. You know, studies have said that over 80% 80 80 of people, 80% of people would go to church if they were only invited. What does that tell us? In the general population, nobody's inviting. No, they don't want to go. No, they're always too busy. No, they got soccer. No, I always see them. They're always going to the, the lake or somewhere else. Have you invited them? Because maybe they would come. Maybe they're waiting to be asked to come to church. Be creative. And then, then it goes on. It says that they didn't just get creative. They got persistent. And I love the fact that they looked at the one doorway that was blocked and they took went up the stairs to the roof and when there wasn't an opening, they got down and started digging. How do you show your faith? You show your faith by getting messy sometimes. They began to dig. And sometimes that it, the digging is, is coming out of your comfort and what you always do and what you always like to do. And you start doing what somebody else likes to do. You start hanging out with somebody else. And all of a sudden you realize, you know, it's not really what I'm into. But you do it anyway because you're there to help them. You make them a priority. What did they do? They started digging. And again, not just a little hole, but a big hole. And when you start to dig, it gets messy. You start to dig, it gets messy. Dirt under the fingernails, dirt on your shirts, on your shoes. Whatever it is, your life begins to get messy. And if you're going to help somebody out, it's going to get messy. But they're persistent. They're persistent doing whatever it takes. And lastly, they were courageous. To pick up a beggar, a paralytic, align yourself with him and say, he's a priority in my life. The world usually has something to say about you. They'll begin to challenge you. What's your connection? Why are you with them? We don't want you with us if you're with him. And all of a sudden, it, it takes some courage to be able to say, hey, I'm going to go where the broken and the lost are. I'm going to align myself with them, those that perhaps are outcasts, those that, that aren't aligned with anybody else. I'm going to get involved with them. And that takes courage to be able to do that, not just dig a hole, but to be able to walk alongside carrying a part of their mat and say, I'm standing with that person. It takes courage to do it when others are looking. I don't know if you can imagine this man on a mat, He's not going anywhere, but you know what he's doing? He's seeing all the feet pass by him to get to that house to get healed and set free. This man is on the mat, and all he's hearing is the sounds of joy and laughter, celebration, excitement, because somebody got set free, somebody got delivered. And all he's doing is watching people go by. 
But the four men said, no, you know what? We're not going to let you go, uh, let this happen. They began to carry him up, and all of a sudden they began to dig from the top of the roof. And I don't know if you can think about what this would be like. Jesus is preaching. Everybody's out there. Jesus is preaching, talking about the parable of the sower of, of, of seed. And he's talking about the different kinds of soil. And then he begins to talk about, he says, you know what? And there's going to be some, and they're 30-fold, and all of a sudden dirt begins to fall right in front of you. And then some are 60-fold, and all of a sudden more grass and dirt are all falling, and people are coughing. <laughs> Can't see all the dust is happening. And then he calls out, and some 100-fold, and boom. This guy just gets lowered right in front of him. That's what happens in the house when Jesus is there and people bring him. All of a sudden, he gets lowered. And Jesus saw their faith, saw the compassion, saw the creativity, saw the persistence and the courage. And because of that, he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. There was an encounter that happened with that man because all of a sudden the four got involved. They were willing to show their faith. The challenge is don't just have faith. Show your faith. But then with these four men, it wasn't just that kind of challenge. The challenge was also, can they be a they? Can you be a they? It says that they brought him to Jesus. Somebody else got involved. They became a, a they. Can you grab hold of somebody else's mat? Are you close enough to draw, pick up somebody else's mat? Do you know somebody that's on a map that you can go and pick it up? Can you be somebody else's they? We all need a they. I need a they. You need a they. They are those that are really know what's going on in your life. If you got somebody in your life that really knows what's going on, that when you are hurting and broken, when you're going through difficulty, they're close enough that they can pick up the mat in your life. Are you close enough to somebody that you're willing to say, I'm willing to listen? I'm willing to actually listen to what's going on because I'm interested? You know, many times you say, hey, how's it going? We go, oh, things are great. But they're not. But you don't know if they're really willing to listen. Can I really show the vulnerability that's in my life of what I'm going through, my difficulty? Am I willing to reveal myself? Well, can I trust them? Are you trustworthy enough that you can become a they in somebody's life that when they say to you, this is going on in me, you hide it, you cover it, you, but you begin to work in their hearts and lives and you're there and you stand for them. God's looking for us to become a they. Can I tell you, I need a they. I thank God I have they in my life because I, I'll be honest with you, I fall, I stumble, I make mistakes, I deal with temptations, I deal with problems, I deal with thoughts, I deal with emotions. I'm human, but I need a they in my life that I can call, that I can walk with, because like you, I stumble. Like you, I trip up, and if I don't have they in my life, then I will fall. But if I have they that are close enough to my life, they're there to hold me. They're there to put me back up. They're there that when I fall and get on a mat for whatever reason, all of a sudden they can lift me back up and bring me to Jesus and pray with me and cover me and all of a sudden encourage me. We all need a they. Can you be a they? Can, but it means that it's not about you anymore. And that's what's so hard in today's world. Everything's about me. Hey, it's selfie generation. Take a picture of a group and you begin to pass it around and say, hey, guys, is this one okay to post? No, I did have my eyes closed. No, I wasn't looking. No, my smile wasn't there. My usual side wasn't there. It's like everybody had something to say because it was all about them. Well, how are we as a group? What are we doing as a group? Can we put this as a group up? And we have to understand that to become a they means we make it about the we and not about me. And the Lord is calling us to become a they, that we are willing to no longer make it about me. Right now, is it all about you, or are you willing to make it about them? But let me tell you about another man that has an encounter, and that's the man on the mat. And that is you and I. We all have had mat experiences where we're down for the count, we're on the mat, we're paralyzed, maybe not in the natural paralyzed, but we're paralyzed somewhere in our spiritual life. 
We're paralyzed with, with, with not just with sin, but we're paralyzed with, with fear. We're paralyzed with discouragement. We're paralyzed with brokenness, with divorce, with, uh, with uh, uh, anxiety and, and depression. We're, we're paralyzed. And we need Jesus. But times we need other people to come alongside and pray with us and encourage us to get us off the mat, bring us to Jesus. We've all had a mad experience, divorce, rejection, abuse, addiction. Before we knew what grace and mercy was, I know I was on the mat. Before I knew what amazing grace was and how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, before that, I was on the mat. Can you imagine this man and hearing this story laying on the mat outside the house and all of a sudden he hears about Jesus who heals and restores and gives purpose of life? And all he's doing is longing, 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 but he can't get there. He has the need, the want, but he needs help. And honestly, that's you and I. We can't do it on our own. We can't get to that place. We need the they, but we have to realize and admit we're on the mat. When's the last time you admitted to somebody or even just to God himself, God, I'm on the mat. This is what's going on in my life. I am paralyzed. I am hurting. God, I'm, I'm being real right now. This is what's happened in my life. Because you can't come to Jesus until you admit you need Jesus. And here's a man that is making it known, I need Jesus. Before I came to Jesus, I was on, like many of you, road to destruction. I didn't know Jesus. I had no idea who Jesus was. I didn't know about God. I didn't know about call of righteousness or any of these things. I was doing my own life, and I was doing it really well. My life was full of failures, and I was succeeding at every one of them. My life was just going downward, downward, downward until all of a sudden somebody, somebody began to pray for me. My girlfriend at that time began to pray for me. And then she got somebody else to pray with her for me. It was like all of a sudden it's not one against one, it's now five against one. That wasn't fair. And then she got some people to carry my mat to Jesus and I found Jesus. And then my girlfriend became my wife, which was really good but it brought me to an encounter. And we're all in need of being lifted up. You might say, well, I was on the mat. Haven't been on the mat again since. Well, you're denying. You're in denial right now because every one of us somewhere are on the mat again. Because life is fragile. Life hurts. Life, there's rejection, betrayal. Life has places of discouragement where all of a sudden we go through such a weight and burden that we get down on the mat again and we need to get up but we need somebody else to help us. We know we need Jesus. The man encountered Jesus and got two things. First, Jesus healed the man. And then he spoke in verse 12. He says, the man rose up, took his bed, went out of the presence of them all. So they're all amazed, glorified God, and said, we never saw anything like this before. Jesus healed him. I love it when Jesus heals. I've been in altar times where Jesus healed people. People come away healed. I've been to India and Africa where I've seen miraculous healings. Does it happen all the time? No, I wish it did. But maybe I wish it didn't because it just means we're more desperate for his presence. But all of a sudden he was healed, but that wasn't what he really needed. He really, really needed was forgiveness. Don't miss this. It says in verse 5, Jesus saw their faith and he said to the paralytic, your son, your sins are forgiven you. He needed a right relationship with God. And if you're ever reading scriptures and you begin to see something taking place, know that there's a greater need that will always surpass the need that we see in the physical realm, and that is the need of getting right with God, forgiveness. And every one of us needs to have that encounter where there's that forgiveness. Ultimately, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. What's he saying? I'm coming for one reason alone, that is to restore sons to the Father that through my death on the cross, it's all about sonship. Every son, every daughter coming back into right relationship through Jesus unto the Father. But can I tell you that even now there are times that, that I fall and hit the mat and I know it's an area that I need forgiveness, that I need to come to the Lord. Lord, there's something in my heart. I'm weighed down, I'm broken down, I'm, I'm needing to get back up. God, forgive me. Some area of my life all of a sudden has gotten skewed and off course. Lord, I know that my mad experience right now is because I, I'm not right with you. I, 
I need to have forgiveness. I can't go a week without this house. Because in this house, when you worship, you're carrying my mat. When you pray, you're helping to carry my mat. We're helping each other. We're, we're encouraging one another. We're building one another up. What are we doing? We're helping carry the mat that we're on towards Jesus in the presence of God. And I love the fact that I can come to the house of God and I know you won't drop me. And I want you to know I won't drop you. As we pray for one another, encourage one another, we're for one another to bless one another. And the challenge is, can you be that man? Can you be that man who's willing to say, I need the Lord. I need healing. I need forgiveness. I need to come out of where I'm at and I need to not have anything hold me back any longer. I need to be right with the Lord. Be somebody that knows that they need help and are willing to call on the Lord and say, Lord, would you not only heal me, but will you forgive me? Forgive me in my relationships. Forgive me as a father, as a mother. Forgive me as a husband, as a wife. Forgive me so there's no breach in my relationship. Let me come off the mat. But there was one other man I want to just end with here. Another one that challenges us. We don't know for sure if it's Peter's house, but here's my question. Here's the challenge to every one of us. Can we be the one that relinquishes whatever God has given us so that the presence of the Lord can meet other people? I love the fact that this house, all of a sudden, got the roof caved in. The roof was torn off. It's open. It was a skylight that they didn't expect, that they didn't want. Who's going to fix it? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to look after it? We don't read of any argument. We don't read of anybody putting up a stink. Anybody saying, ah, oh, can you believe when Jesus shows up, he ruins houses. Well, ruin it for the kingdom, that's okay. But here's a guy that says, hey, whatever I've got, it's yours. If it means taking the roof off so that other people can come to know Jesus, I'm okay with that. See, can we be the one that transitions from owners to stewards? that we realize that even the house we have isn't ours. The means that I had to get the house, God gave it to me. Well, no, it was my wisdom that got this business company going. Who gave you the brains? Who gave you the smarts? Who gave you the idea? Who gave you the relationships? Who gave you whatever it took for you to get the finances to get whatever you think you own? Because you don't own a thing. You're only a steward. And one day, when you stand before the Lord, you'll have none of that stuff with you, but the Lord will ask you, what did you do with it? And I believe the challenge for every one of us in this materialistic, narcissistic, independent, self-made world is to ask ourselves, Lord, what am I holding on so tight that I'm not willing to be that one that's willing to give it up so that other people can know who Jesus Christ is? The Lord's not asking you for your house. Well, you, if you want to kick it in, go ahead. But it's not what he's asking for. He's asking for your heart that becomes a heart of generosity for the things of the kingdom. The generosity, not just what's in your hands, what's in your pocket, what, what, what's in your home, because everything you have is not yours. And it's just, are you willing to say, God, whatever it takes, the kingdom is all, it's all about the kingdom. You and I are left on this earth after salvation for a reason, and that is to make Jesus known. Everything else is all pulled together for one purpose. Can you make Jesus known? In your home, in your relationships, in your job, in your finances, in your sports, in, in your careers, in your education, whatever you're doing, whatever God gives for you to do, are you able to do it in such a way that Jesus is made known? And it doesn't mean we live in poverty. It doesn't mean we leave out in existence. We don't become martyrs. We don't have to go on the mission field. That's not what this is about. This is about our heart being laid open. Like this man that says, you need my house? Take it. Whatever you need, Lord, it's yours. Here's the challenge. Can I live with a tear the roof off mentality in whatever it is that God has given us? When we encounter Jesus, there will always be an encounter for us to change, to become closer, to have a, be used in a greater capacity. And that's the challenge for every one of us. Don't be satisfied with who you are. Become who God's called you to be. Don't just have faith, let our faith be seen. With compassion, creativeness, uh, persistence, courage, 
don't just live for ourselves, but can we live in such a way that we become somebody else's they? We carry them, we lead them, we bring them. We don't live in isolation, but in community. Can we pursue Jesus not just to be healed, but can we be forgiven? Boy, that's hard. But can we be that one that when we get on the mat, we come to Jesus to get off the mat? And lastly, can we come to Jesus and keep coming because life is fragile and then be willing to say, Lord, whatever I have, it's yours. Encounters with Jesus. And if I was to pick something that I could pray about right now with you, that I can encourage you is, can you become a they to somebody else? Can you pray for somebody, carry the burden for somebody? Can you have a listening ear for somebody? Can you walk close enough to somebody else that when you begin to see them fall, you get a little closer because you know they're going to need to lean on somebody? You see, family and community is really about being a they. Can you be a they for somebody? And I believe the challenge here today is look in your life right now and ask yourself, who's your they? Who's the one in your life? Or are you walking alone? Because when you walk alone and you fall, you've got nobody there to pick you up. You need people. We need people. We all need to be the body of Christ that can become a they. Now, I know in this church, there's a lot of people that really don't know each other. That's going to take time to build it. Relationships, fun activities, all different things we can do. But I want to encourage you, find somebody that can become a they in your life. Ask them, hey, can you pray for me? Start there. Start with a coffee. Start with a phone call. Start with a text. Start with some way of connecting. And then you pull somebody else in. Hey, there's two of us. Let's have three of us. And all of a sudden, we begin to pray, encourage one another, and lift one another up. And I believe that's a challenge for every one of us. There's not one of us that wouldn't say that I don't want to have a they in my life or Maybe I don't want to be a they. So can I just do this? Can we all stand here as we close? And before we, before we end up in worship, I want to pray for you right now that there would be stirring in your heart that says, you know, I'm willing to go beyond myself and live for somebody else. I'm going to become a they. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's somebody you don't even know, but you're willing to step up and say, God, I want to be a they. They carried the paralytic to Jesus. Who are you carrying? Who's leaning on you? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we look into this story of Jesus, the encounter, Lord. There's so many things that God, we call out and say, is it I? Is this me? Can it be me? Don't let this be me. But Lord, we pray right now. We want to be a they. Lord, we want to say we don't want to live for ourselves. We want to live alongside other people, encourage them, bless them, do the one another's, 51 another's that are found in the New Testament, how we love one another, encourage one another, bless one another, build one another, cheer one another. God, we want to be one another's, but that means we have to be they. We want to carry somebody else's mat. Lord, I know in my heart right now, I know there's certain ones that are doing that right now. They are carrying the mat of somebody else. I say, God, strengthen them. Because sometimes it's a long road to carry the mat. But God, give them wisdom. Give all of us understanding. Give all of us the, the spirit of wisdom and understanding to know what to do, Lord, what to say. And for those of us that need a they, I pray divinely you would give them a they. Somebody to come alongside them individually in their home, in their marriage, in their family, in their job, in their workplace. Somebody to come alongside to help them walk this journey to encounter Jesus every day. Lord, the house of God, this is your house, Lord. We thank you for what you're building. We're excited. God, continue to build us together and bless this church, Lord, with your presence. We say that in Jesus' name. You know, if you're on a mat right now and you need prayer, we have leaders that will pray with you. I encourage you just to come to the front and some of our leaders will join you. They'll follow you up and they'll just pray with you. We're not a church of individuals. We're a community. That means we pray with one another. We encourage one another. We bless one another. Great to have you with us today. Let's worship the Lord. And if you need prayer, come up, and then we'll close off here shortly. Come on, let's sing mountains. Oh, mountains tremble when you speak. I'm listening whisper changes everything almighty god there's no one like you 
so good to be in the house of God coming together. Keep coming. Keep bringing those that perhaps you know that are a little tentative coming back. Encourage them. Just tell them what the Lord is doing in the house. Noise it about. Let everybody know. Great to have James on the keyboard here with us here today. Great having him. Talia's boyfriend and uh, helps us out with sound as well. So God bless them. Have a great day. Enjoy. We do have fellowship out, out front here for everybody and uh, we encourage you. Just have a great week. Get in the flow, carry somebody's mat, lift the roof off the house, noise it about, Jesus in the house. Just encounter the Lord every day. God's calling to you. God bless you. We'll see you uh, next Sunday. And don't forget about all the different activities on Friday night with the Exquisite Company. 25th, we're having the park activities. We're looking forward to that. God bless you. We'll see you again soon.